The Axio Stent and Delivery System is a unique endoscopic device that creates a durable anastomosis between the GI tract and a target structure using the Axio Stent. The specially designed handle allows the interventional endoscopist to accurately deliver the Axio Stent while managing control of the echo endoscope. Numbered arrows on the handle correspond with the steps of the deployment procedure. The black catheter shaft marker indicates proper positioning of the Axio stent during deployment. Radiopaque markers are located within the nose cone and the stent retainer. The stent is available in two sizes, 10 mm by 10 mm and 15 mm by 10 mm. The stent length is measured between the two stent anchors. The Axio stent has a large lumen diameter designed to optimize drainage. Its dual anchor design prevents migration and maintains tissue apposition. The Axio stent is fully covered to prevent leakage of fluid, resist tissue ingrowth, and enable ease of removal. Insert the Axios into the working channel over a previously placed 035 guide wire and lock the handle to the endoscope by rotating the lure lock clockwise onto the scope hub. Step number one. Under EUS guidance, advance the catheter into the cyst by unlocking the catheter lock and moving the catheter control hub downward until the distal catheter is in the desired location within the cyst. Lock the catheter lock. Step number two. Deploy the distal anchor of the stent. Remove and discard the yellow safety clip on the stent deployment hub. Unlock the stent lock and slide the stent deployment hub upwards until the stent deployment hub locks into place at the white line next to the number two arrow. Step number three. Pull the endoscope back slightly in order to directly visualize the catheter shaft in the GI tract. Unlock the catheter lock and slide the catheter control hub upwards until at least two to three millimeters of the black catheter shaft marker is visible in the GI tract. This indicates that the Axio stent is correctly positioned for the final stage of deployment. Then, lock the catheter lock. Step four, unlock the stent lock and slide the stent deployment hub upwards towards the number four arrow until the stent deployment hub meets the top of the handle and the proximal anchor of the Axio stent is deployed and visible in the GI tract. Remove the Axios delivery system by rotating the lure lock counterclockwise and pulling the device from the scope. Hello. Hi, everyone. I think uh, welcome to this session. And uh, I can see all the uh, faculties here. And also, um, we I'm uh, co-chairing with uh, Dr. Uh, Jiri Rao. So Jiri, uh, maybe you can start the introduction. Kiwi, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. At the outset, let us thank the ELSA organization for this beautiful uh, session on technological advances in endovenous surgery. We have a host of uh, I mean, phenomenal speakers who have been selected from across the globe to give you some real uh, cutting edge technology that is uh, making inroads into endoscopic practice. Uh, so we have uh, uh, six, uh, five uh, talks today. Without much ado, I think we should start the first presentation. Uh, I think Dr. Inouye is not there, so can we start our presentation with uh, Dr. Nika Nakajima from Japan, uh, from Okasa University. He would be talking to us on technological advances in endoluminal surgery. Uh, Dr. Nakajima, the screen is yours, and you have 11 minutes for your presentation, and uh, one more minute again before we stop your presentation. Over to Professor Nakajima from Japan, Osaka University. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Professor Rao, for your kind introduction. Uh, this is Dr. Nakajima from Osaka, Japan. Uh, I'm a surgeon, and my main uh, research interest is uh, R&D of uh, medical devices with industries. It's my great honor and pleasure uh, to be here on the line to talk about uh, some technological advances for endoluminal surgery. Um, the slide shows the first-gen uh, gastroscope uh, 
uh, developed by Olympus in 1950. Uh, as you can see, uh, the basic design of a flexible gastrointestinal endoscope has not been changed for nearly 70 years. Of course, we have, um, just a moment. Uh, of course, we have um, a bunch of technological advances in these uh, 70 years. Among those advances, some of them were, maybe we can say, innovations or disruptions, such as transition from the uh, peeping endoscope to fiberscope, or the, from the fiberscope to CCD scope, um, development of some biopsy forceps, uh, like or other energy devices like IT knife, and so on. But if we can see changes in recent 20 years, um, I must say most of the changes has been limited in the improvement of the uh, imaging technology, such as zoom endoscopy, special light observation like NBI or FIS. Some improvement can be seen in handling uh, of the endoscope itself. And yes, we have uh, serious downsizing, but no other drastic uh, change or innovations. When we take a look at the uh, instrumentation, the situation is almost the same. There are certain um, sustaining uh, improvement in device uh, functions, but we still have no totally new devices like staplers or clips or harmonics in the, in, in the field of flexible endoscopy. Recently, we have some advances using the IC technologies, but most of them have been focused on, on diagnosis, not interventions. Um, we, have, uh, we have Node VIPs as a chairman um, in the session, as you can see. If we take a look back uh, 15 years ago when the Node's movement was active, uh, we had a long, long wish list uh, to industries. When I, when I take a look at this now, most of these issues raised there have not been solved. The endoscopic submucosal dissection, ESD, is amazing technology. But I have to say, this technology has not become feasible with the advancement in endoscopes or instrumentations, but mostly with the continuous efforts of endoscopists to improve their skills and techniques. My friend in the States says, he's a surgeon, he says that the ASD is like this. In another way, we must say that the endoscopic procedure is like this. You have your knife on your head. You never use your both hands. And more precisely, maybe you cannot see things with your both eyes, maybe one single eyes, because most of the endoscopic images are still uh, 2D. On the contrary, we surgeons can use our both hands, uh, which are totally independent from our head or eyes. Of course, we can see things with our both eyes because 3D laparoscopy has become uh, almost practical in our daily practice. So the gap between the endoscopy and the laparoscopy has not been narrowed for these years. Even nodes movement has not been so much helpful to bridge these two different types of endoscopy. So how we can go forward towards true endoluminal surgery? I think we should not be so greedy like, like when we were in the nodes movement. The slide shows the minimal wish list from me, only three uh, major points. The first one is the stable working space uh, like a pneumoperitoneum for laparoscopy. The automatic space creation and establishment, maintenance, without any collapse during section. And this must be also the very important in the era of COVID-19, no leakage of the insufflation gas or smoke, why, uh, which, is, which may contain some aerosol uh, substances like viruses. The second thing is the manipulation. The endoscopist should use their both hands 
to make a tissue triangulation possible. The hands should be independent from their scope. And then lastly, we should have been, we should be more conscious about the, uh, the uh, ergonomics. The system should be more user friendly. Um, there are via various solutions uh, for these issues, but I can just say that some of our ideas and possible uh, solutions. When I show this slide, most of the endoscopy says that we are satisfied with the manual insufflation. There's nothing um, troubled. If we ask the same question to the car drivers in 1950s, they might have the same answer. Because they could not imagine how the automatic transmission is easy and reliable. This is a transition of the percentage of the automatic transmissions in the car sold in our country. You can see in, even in Japan, some old generations still adhere to a manual transmission, but the situation is so obvious. It's like almost 100% in the market. So this is the, um, the uh, automatic gas insufflation system for flexible GI endoscopy which enables uh, the laparoscopy-like uh, insufflation in, inside the gut lumen. Um, the video shows how we can uh, um, insufflate gut lumen with this uh, device. Uh, it's like a, like a surgical insufflator. So, so all you have to do is just set the uh, preset value of the pressure, and then the system can automatically feed the insufflation gas through the endoscope. You don't have to put your finger on the AW button and if you want to increase the, uh, the pressure, all you have to do is just change the, the value so that you have the additional insufflation. It's like a laparoscopy. <clears throat> and then the most striking thing in this system is that you can now reproduce your exposure by, uh, by regulating the pressure. And all you have to do is just set the value. Now the insufflation technique has become very reproducible and a standardized way. And this must be one solution to standardize the, uh, the, the flex endoscopy. You can see the differences. And then pressure using this system, you can see very stable um, values compared to the on-demand manual insufflation as you can use currently. And you can see if we can use this system uh, with the uh, standard smoke evacuation system simultaneously, then you can continuously exchange the gas inside the lumen. I believe this must be one solution for infection control of the airs of generating procedures in the era of COVID-19. Um, the first generation of our insufflator uh, has cleared the Japanese regulation and we are now improving the system for more practical application. This is my concept of the future and that would be, I, I don't say that the automatic trans insufflation should totally replace the, the current manual insufflation, but at least we should know the pressure that we're using inside the lumen and uh, a kind of a semi-automatic pressure regulation can enhance any kinds of uh, complicated endoscopic interventions. Um, the second is uh, issue, the triangulation, I think uh, as a surgeon, I have to say that this is always the key to success in any types of advanced procedures. And I understand that ultimately the flexible robot, maybe the, uh, the Professor Chu, we're going to talk later, um, so I will not talk in details, but uh, the flexible robot can be a solution. Um, this must be a true innovation, but I think we need some more time till it's a full installation into our daily practice. So, so what we can do now using the, the current endoscope and the current instrumentation. One solution from us is the use of operating uh, overture which has a, a built-in uh, built side channel inside the wall of the endoscope. Uh, you can see this is the uh, side channel, which you can pass uh, the, any kinds of uh, grasping forceps commercially available. And uh, you can grasp the tissue with this uh, rasper and then they control the tissue. 
like this. While your endoscope can be stabilized, and all you have to do is just rotate the overture around the endoscope like this so that you can give the virtually any directions to the tissue. So this can be very helpful to get the, uh, uh, the ideal uh, tissue traction uh, for the advanced type of endoscopy. Um, we have already uh, completed the R&D phase and uh, now we are in a clinical evaluation of this device in using the human subjects. Uh, uh, you can see uh, this is the patient with the esophageal cancer. So using the standard endoscope, we already had the circumferential pre-cut of the mucosa so that you can see the lesion uh, inside the dotting uh, marks. And you can see the center channel is now rotating with the overtube. And you can see the grasper, which is passed through the center channel. So then you can rotate again around the endoscope. The key is to stabilize the endoscope, not rotating the endoscope, so that you can have a very nice traction on the cerebral tissue. So this can be a kind of a surgery-like uh, procedures inside the lumen. And without using the bimanual flexible robot, maybe we can have uh, this kind of a transitional uh, device uh, towards uh, the uh, true endoluminal procedures. Um, due to the time limitation and some IP issues, um, I am not discussing the last issues, but I think this must be also very important for the future of, uh, of endoluminal surgery because in, in a 25 or 30 years ago, but the most of the surgeons were not so much aware of the ergonomics in the laparoscopic surgery, but now most of the laparoscopic surgeons are very conscious about that. So, so we need to do this anyway. So um, uh, in summary, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time to give up the technique with the knives of our heads. The improvement is in imaging technology is okay, but we need some more substantial improvement or disruption or innovations that transforms the current shape of a flexible endoscopy. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nagajima. So uh, uh, I, uh, we don't have any uh, question from for me. Maybe, um, just uh, uh, one question for me. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, <clears throat> about um, the insufflation. Uh, so I think your your insufflation is uh, important that uh, you can control the pressure. And uh, we also know that the uh, endoscopy is now considered as a aerosol generating procedure during the COVID. So um, would you think that uh, this uh, control in the pressure uh, and the reduction of the kind of uh, aerosol generation during excessive insufflation can prevent transmission of uh, COVID. Thank you, um, Philip. Um, for, that's such a nice question. Um, we have no data at this time uh, to, uh, to uh, prove the reduction of the aerosols by using the pressure regulation technology. But uh, theoretically, uh, we can avoid the excessive insufflation by using the pressure regression technology. So uh, maybe as in the result, uh, we can uh, at, at least reduce the, the amount of the smoke or the amount of the uh, excessive gases, which can be escaped from the GI lumen. So can be leading to our reduction of the aerosol uh, using, uh, containing the viruses. Okay, thank you very much uh, again for your wonderful uh, enlightening lecture. So uh, we should uh, move on uh, to our next speaker, who is uh, Professor Haruhiro Inoue. Uh, Professor Inoue is uh, currently uh, the president of uh, the JGES and uh, also uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, professor and also the uh, chairman of the Digestive uh, Center at the Shonwa University uh, Koto Toyosu Hospital in the Japan. So, uh, Professor Inoue, uh, we are looking forward to your lecture on innovation in surgical endoscopy. Uh, voice, uh, Professor Inoue, uh, unmute, unmute your voice. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, uh, at first of all, I really, really appreciate the uh, 
um, all the organizers. But so last one hour, I struggle uh, uh, to uh, connect, but I failed. But now it's uh, it's okay. I mean, so uh, particularly I'm I'm um, very sorry to Nakajima Sensei. So <laughs> anyway, so I would like to start my lecture. Um, okay. Oh. Okay. So we so we. Um, So it's still, still, um, Philip. Philip. Yeah. Can you share the screen? Can you share your screen? So still, uh, my 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 uh, PC condition is unstable. So uh, please uh, go to uh, next speaker. I'm, okay. I'm going, going to the rest. Okay. Okay. Don't worry. I, I uh, was very sorry. I'm very sorry. Okay. I am actually the next speaker, so I I can present first. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, Akiri. So it's my pleasure to introduce my friend Philip Chu from Chinese University, Prince of Wales, Hong Kong. Uh, he is one of the persons who's got umpteen number of innovations to his credit. Uh, I think robotics is his passion and he has been working on this for quite some time. Uh, so we would like to hear from Philip directly, what are the recent advances of the endoluminal robotics that we're using for ESDS and today? What is their, their role today and what, do you, uh, what promise do they hold in future for us? Uh, the screen is yours, uh, Philip. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh GV, and uh, I think you can all see uh, my screen. So uh, I'd like to share with you uh, the uh, endoluminal robotics uh, for ESD. So as uh, Professor Nakajima uh, mentioned about the development of uh, endoscopy, I think uh, there has been uh, tremendous advances in the uh, development of endoscopy, mainly is uh, from the light source optics and processor. So there has been a significant improvement in terms of the resolution in illumination and the, uh, on the therapeutic side, the only thing that uh, we have added is a working channel. So what, which part of endoscopy may be improved in future by technology? I think uh, firstly, from the diagnostic imaging processing and analysis, I think uh, AI or computer-aided diagnosis is going to help us to detect uh, more of this early lesion. And secondly, for the steering and locomotion, we may be uh, combining image-guided or sensors and also robotics. So I think uh, as also mentioned by uh, Professor Nakajima, so uh, endoluminal therapy will be greatly enhanced with the use of the robotics. So in the next 20 years, I believe uh, there, has, there will be a revolution in terms of the improvement in efficiency and quality of diagnostic endoscopy, as well as increasing potential for therapeutic endoscopy. So we already seen um, the increasing potential of therapeutic endoscopy over the past 30 years, starting with uh, the performance of uh, polypectomy. Uh, we have the EMR, ESD, and the year 2000, uh, there's the concept of NOCs. Uh, and the NOCs did not end in a really uh, surgical intervention through the flexible endoscopy, but it landed with the first phase endoscopy with start of the POEM procedure by Professor Inoue and then it's beginning of the submucosal endoscopy. So as uh, when we are increasing the potential of uh, therapeutic endoscopy, we can see that uh, ESD has been commonly practiced for treatment of early GI cancer. Uh, there is uh, not only a locally curative intent treatment, but organ preservation and also better post-operative outcome. But uh, nicely illustrated with uh, the uh, diagram from uh, Professor Nakajima. So we are using the knife attached to our head. So the eyes is moving with uh, the knife to make uh, ESD practice uh, really difficult. So in one of our training workshop uh, the, on the ESD procedure, uh, we have uh, trained both gastroenterologists and surgeons to perform ESD in the animal model. So 
uh, actually there is uh, 62% of a perforation rate at the very beginning of the first procedure of the ESD because of its difficulty. But then we also learn from uh, surgery uh, with the uh, improvement in the technology application for minimal invasive surgery. Uh, we are enhanced by the use of the 3D laparoscope and also the robotics providing us with a very stable platform for a decent uh, oncological diagnosis, especially like in here, um, it is my procedure for uh, laparoscopic gastrectomy with uh, D2 lymph node dissection. So I think uh, these technology help us to ensure a good high quality of uh, surgical uh, procedure. So can we add this uh, technology to therapeutic endoscopy? So perhaps uh, from the imaging, we need a 3D or even 4K in the future. For tissue retraction and dissection, we need a good retraction device. And also for tissue approximation, we may need suturing and stapling from the flexible endoscopy. So uh, this is uh, one of the system developed uh, for MET Robotics uh, where they have a robotized endoscope and uh, putting in uh, for uh, performance of uh, endoscopic uh, procedure. It's been clear for US FDA for performance of transoral surgery by ENT and also for transrectal uh, procedures. But the uh, limitation is that the scope cannot pass beyond maybe the sigmoid. And uh, the other system developed uh, uh, a robotized endoscope is uh, from the ERCAT, uh, which is a uh, develop further development from the animbiscope in the past. So uh, in the animal study, uh, they actually demonstrated that uh, with this kind of uh, triangulation approach, they will be able to achieve a good uh, ESD procedure as well. So uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Lawrence Ho from National University of Singapore and Professor Louis Fee from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, uh, we actually developed this uh, master and slave transluminal endoscopic robot. So idea is like uh, using the uh, CRAP core uh, to uh, perform the ESD procedure. So uh, from our team of uh, collaboration, uh, we actually published the world first uh, robotic gastric ESD uh, series in the year 2012. And uh, this is uh, the first prototype of uh, the master robot, which has uh, two robotic arms attached to a double channel endoscope. And the editorial written by Professor Rob Hoss uh, saying that the robotic endoscopy is more case series, a giant step uh, for endoscopy. So you can also see three patients from India and uh, Professor G. V. Rao is one of our uh, collaborator. So the uh, the uh, master robot has been developed into the second generation system. This is the EndoMaster EC system. And this has a uh, redesigned platform together with a uh, working channel for two robotic arm and also one accessory channel. So this is the concept of the EndoMaster EC system. So the surgeon is sitting in one of the console and uh, while uh, two robotic arm is passing uh, over the uh, redesigned uh, endoscope. And uh, we have uh, previously conducted the several uh, animal preclinical trial. So this is one of our preclinical trial on the esophageal ESD uh, in the animal model. You can see that uh, the two robotic arm is uh, designed to locate it over the six o'clock and the nine o'clock position to achieve the best ergonomics for the performance of ESD. And also with the lifting uh, action from uh, one of the uh, grasping forceps, we will be able to see the submucosa clearly and then the perform the uh, submucosal dissection. So um, we also adopt some of uh, the uh, learning point that we have uh, from the performance of single port uh, surgery, that the retraction do not need to be really uh, in a triangulation, but also it can be retracting from cranial to the caudal direction so that uh, we can expose and uh, maximize uh, the submucosal exposure for a safe performance of uh, the ESD. So, and uh, you can see that this is uh, also a, uh, a live pick uh, model experiment for performance of uh, ESD in the rectum. So, which is uh, 24 centimeter from the anal verge in the porting model. So, uh, this system we can now perform the whole procedure of the ESD, including uh, the uh, mucosal incision and the uh, lifting, and then the submucosal dissection, as you can see here. 
and then they completing the circumferential uh, incision. So like that. So, so now uh, we are very uh, honored uh, to have uh, started yeah. uh, the first uh, clinical is. trial on the performance of uh, the uh, ESD using the uh, Endomaster EC system. So uh, in the uh, time of the COVID pandemics, uh, we have uh, pioneered this uh, very first uh, clinical trial yeah. for performance of uh, colorectal ESD. So it is uh, now undergoing a clinical trial. You can see that uh, this is a uh, uncut uh, video on performance of um, the robotic ESD. So this is actually in the proximal transverse colon, 90 centimeters from the uh, uh, anal verge. So our system will be able to reach um, the uh, proximal colon as well as the distal colon. And uh, so you can see that uh, the dissection is uh, quite smooth and we'll be able to achieve the lifting and also the submucosal dissection with uh, the use of this uh, Endomaster EC system. So, and uh, we always uh, re be able to reposition the grafts so that uh, we can enhance uh, the dissection procedure and uh, uh, during the uh, ESD. And uh, this is uh, especially a difficult position because it is uh, over the uh, one of the uh, Prostration and the turning points over the proximal transverse colon. So sometimes uh, we are not using the uh, forceps only for lifting, but for retraction. As you can see, pretty much like the surgical resection. And uh, we can uh, retract using the left arm and dissection perform using the uh, right arm. And uh, we have to also take care about uh, the uh, margin of the lesion. But unlike uh, the uh, conventional ESD, we do not. Uh, completely uh, perform the circumferential incision before we proceed to some reposal dissection. And uh, this is the final part of um, the procedure. So now uh, we are completing this uh, procedure with the final dissection over the uh, distal part of the mucosa. As you can see, I can flip the mucosa over so we can actually ensure a good uh, clear resection margin by looking at the, uh, uh, the mucosa. So this is the final part and, uh, of the procedure. So we have completed uh, and uh, we can then remove the specimen. So this is the specimen, you can see a clear resection margin. So, and uh, our system is also developing uh, in terms of uh, advanced uh, and luminal uh, intervention like the suturing. So in the future, we may apply the suturing in terms of uh, full fitness resection, obesity surgery and emergency. So in summary, I think the future of uh, the luminal robotics should be uh, a development of uh, further technological development in terms of the imaging with the 3D endoscopic platform and also uh, the start of the testing of this uh, and the luminal robotic platform in the clinical trial and also to have uh, some of the uh, procedure being automated uh, through the uh, endoscopic robot. So thank you very much. So <clears throat> I think uh, because of time, I think we have to move on. So I, uh, whether Professor Inui is okay yes. for your lecture? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so Bye. maybe we move on to Professor Inui. Can you see my slides? Yes. It's good. So um, <clears throat> thank you again uh, for your patience. And the, uh, I would like to talk about the uh, poem and the uh, poem plus fund application. So, so far we performed the poem with more than 2000 uh, patients in a hospital and the result was uh, not bad. Other hospital, um, any other hospital, major hospital result was good. So um, one, one point, how to avoid the uh, uh, postponed GERD, and the point is the uh, double scope method. So this was the first report is of Portuguese doctors like this, the um, intragastric um, pediatric scope, we can see the submucosal endoscopy, and then we can control the myotomy, gastric myotomy rings in a appropriate um, rings. And then um, another solution of uh, 
uh, postponed GERD is to perform a fund application. So we have already reported uh, that this procedure uh, POEM plus uh, fund application. So uh, three years ago, uh, we did the first case. Um, so far, we performed this procedure in uh, 43 cases. Um, this is the uh, um, clip uh, technique. So uh, anterior wall dissection and then get in a sub, um, abdominal cavity and then make a, a anterior partial fund application. So now we use the uh, uh, suturing device. This is a hand suturing uh, device uh, developed by Dr. Goto. And we also use a VLOC. And the procedure is like this. Uh, through the submucosal tunnel, after myotomy, we get in an abdominal cavity and then uh, catch the anterior wall of the stomach that was a distal anchoring, and then uh, we also place a proximal anchoring. Uh, we normally place uh, two stitches. Um, after completing the uh, POEM procedure uh, in an anterior submucosal tunnel, now we are dissecting the peritoneum. And then behind, you can see a backside of the left liver lobe. Now we open the peritoneum enough to pass the submucosal endoscope into the abdominal cavity. And then, uh, sir, so this is abdominal cavity. Uh, we approach to the anterior wall of the stomach. Now we place uh, the uh, stitch onto the, uh, uh, yes, uh, full layer fashion. Then uh, this is the uh, uh, second scope in the stomach. We can see a needle is coming into the stomach and then out. So this is a proximal, proximal anchoring. Now we try to uh, catch the uh, light cruise in a submucosal tunnel. Then uh, when we pull the uh, V-lock, then uh, we can create a, a fund application. Uh, it's uh, very similar to doll. So technical success rate uh, was 100%. Uh, this is a pH uh, monitoring after procedure uh, in the POEM plus fund application group uh, compared to the uh, control group, um, statistically significant uh, improve, improve was uh, identified. So um, uh, this is the uh, uh, schematic drawing of our, all the anti reflux procedures. So, POEM plus fund application is a pure notes procedure and then a similar effect uh, to a doll partial fund application. So, um, this is our, this is my last slide. Um, now we are trying to do uh, the uh, poem alone in the posterior, that is our standard. So just in case it's a less than 1%, if the patient becomes a severe GERD, then we perform the poem, uh, poem, poem, uh, per over endoscopic fund application in the anterior wall of the uh, esophagus. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And I, I, I apologize to all the uh, uh, panelists um, my uh, PC trouble. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Inoue. So a very nice lecture. And uh, I think uh, we will leave all the questions to uh, the last. And uh, I think uh, it is my great honor to introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor G. V. Rao, uh, who is from uh, Hyderabad, uh, India. So uh, G. V. is uh, currently uh, serving as uh, Director and Chief of uh, GI and Minimal Invasive Surgery at the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology in Hyderabad. So G. V. is going to talk about uh, medicinum, the new endoscopic terrain. G. V. please.
Thank you so much. Uh, at the outset, let me thank the ELSA and the ex entire executive for the honor of this webinar today. Uh, as gastro clinicians, actually, we are concerned with two body cavities. We are co concerned with the abdominal and the pelvic cavity and the thoracic cavity. In the last few decades or so, the surgeons and the endoscopists have conquered majority of the pathology that we encounter in the abdominal and pelvic cavities and also in the thoracic cavity. Now, these two cavities have been absolutely conquered and the endoscopists and the surgeons are getting into the pleural cavity. And so far, the endoscopists have been restricting their interventions to purely luminal side, but have, as you've seen from Professor Philip Chu and from uh, Professor Inouye, these interventions have started going from luminal side to extra luminal side and onto the peritoneal side and onto the pleural side. Surgery traditionally has been restricted predominantly onto the peritoneal side, onto the pleural side. Now the new terrain that uh, we are entering is the, the thoracic cavity and more specifically into the mediastinum with the advent of third space endoscopy. We seem to be slightly gaining confidence to enter into the new endoscopic terrain that is the mediastinum. All of us would be wondering what is the pathology that we have in mediastinum. You can see umpteen number of organs, vessels, veins, lymphatic and nerve, and then we have umpteen uh, pathology that we have seen both from congenital anomalies to uh, neoplastic lesions that we encounter from various of these organs and structures that are seen in the mediastinum. And so far, the mediastinal interventions are purely biopsies, or you drain some procedures or do some resections. And conventionally, it has been the open surgery that has been the gold standard for managing these patients with mediastinal pathology. Now, conventionally, surgical is open. Either we had a thoracotomy, we had the sternotomy, like a very, very morbid procedure like this, wherein we used to use a pure thoracotomy or you do a cervical, you enter the mediastinum to the cervical room. This is one classical example of how you get into the thorax to the thoracotomy, and this is the suprasternal access into the mediastinum. Now, these procedures have been very, very morbid to gain into the peritoneal cavity. Now, we have a minimally invasive surgery that has come in a big way, thoracoscopy or robotic surgery, or we call about medical endoscopy, that we talk about endoscopy, which is indirect. We can talk about endoscopic ultrasound, uh, uh, endobronchial ultrasound or direct visualization through natural orifice surgery or radiological interventions like CT ultrasound and MRCP. Uh, uh, the last few decades, actually, there have been rapid advances in minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery and thoracoscopic surgery. With the advent of uh, thoracoscopic surgery, a lot of these media sternal structures, including esophageal resections, uh, foreign bodies like this, which are not able to extract endoscopically or large DMIMRs or tumors which are not amenable for endoscopic resection are all being subject to, to, to minimally invasive thoracoscopic resection. These are all uh, standardized right now. And we also have sometimes when you have a transhatal access, actually in addition to the thoracoscopic access to gain access into the media sternum, we have the transhatal access, especially for esophageal resections like this, in which we can mobilize the esophagus through the transhatus and then bring it down. So these have been standard procedures and these minimally invasive procedures have become the standard of care and it has been shown by this meta-analysis that MIS is superior in terms of perioperative complications and in-hospital mortality and it has completely replaced uh, open surgery as in today in many of the centers. And uh, the ERAS protocols also mandate that we include minimally invasive surgical techniques into media sternal uh, intervention so that the post-operative recovery is good. And it has been shown to be associated with significant improved outcomes in all these patients whenever these patients go to MIS and ERAS protocols. So endoscopic intervention, as I told you, predominantly they were luminal. Then subsequently we went on to do mucosal lesions and with the advent of third space endoscopy, a lot of other procedures like OIM and uh, yeah, subepithelial tumors have been resected using this procedure. The indirect way of visualizing the media sternum has been by use of endoscopic ultrasound. I mean, umpteen number of uh, innovations, uh, modifications in the endoscopic ultrasound scope that has led to visualization of a lot of these tumors. Not only tumors, actually now with the advent of 
with the most sophisticated equipment, we are able to see lesions which are not initially amenable, basically because of the high resolution scope. And also, these are amenable to guided biopsies. Both fine needle aspirations and fine needle biopsies are possible through these lesions. The biggest uh, disadvantage is that there are some lesions which are farther away from the esophagus, and because of the limitation of the scope, limitation of the accessories that are available, these cannot traverse greater lengths than what is uh, what is there as in today to access distant lesions in the media stem. Now we have this. Uh, there are some of these procedures have been done. This is a video shared by my colleague Sandeep, who has done a biopsy across the aorta. You can see this. He has taken a vessel. He has uh, taken a biopsy from a node piercing to the aorta and going across the aorta and taking this biopsy. These are some heroic procedures, but these have got some limitations. These are these are the limitations basically because of the distance of the lesion to the scope as in today. Uh, endobronchial ultrasound is another good modality to take up this uh, interventions actually from one side if you're not accessible we go on to the endobronchial sound, uh, ultrasound and lesions which are not accessible to endoscopic ultrasound seem to be accessible on endobronchial ultrasound so a combination of endoscopic ultrasound and endobronchial ultrasound seem to be an alternative to uh, get biopsies from lesions which are farther away from the esophagus now, but this uh, both endobronchial ultrasound and endoscopic ultrasound, though they've been very significantly made inroads into the management, they are associated with some minor adverse effects, which these are all acceptable minor uh, uh, or major adverse effects, which can be uh, which can be uh, easily treated. And also, there are several mediastinal cystic lesions which are amenable to uh, aspiration through this uh, endoscopic ultrasound equipment that we have as of today. There are empty number of promising uh, areas wherein it can further go using this conventional or further modified endoscopic ultrasound or EBUS machines, uh, diagnosing and staging of lung cancer, diagnosing and subtyping of lymphomas, diagnostics uh, of infections by special microbiological stains and therapeutic uses like uh, injection therapy, mediastinal cyst drainage, and of, of course we need some simulated training to do all these procedures. But as I told you, the biggest limitation of this as of today is either we can do an aspiration, we can do a biopsy or a fluid aspiration. A complete node biopsy is not feasible because this is the limitation as of today. Majority of the time, we know that the limitation of FNA, FNB, uh, we may not be able to get the true histopathological uh, uh, diagnosis. So a complete nodal biopsy may be mandatory in some of these cases, and node biopsy is the gold standard for management of many of these pathologies. The first ever time that we tried to visualize the media stenum in the current day practice is when, a, when we are doing this OEM procedure, inadvertently when we cut the circular and the longitudinal muzzle folds, we get into the media stenum. And uh, majority of the time we are doing a posterior or an anterior myotomy, so we are not able to see the structures in the media stenum. Because unless and until we make an, uh, we make an access in the subcranial area in the lateral direction, will not be able to visualize this thing. But the first ever encounter with this media stenum seems to be with the third space endoscopists who have cut both the circular and the longitudinal muzzles, and we're able to visualize the media stenum. This is a new terrain. Now, is need for is there need for diagnostic direct media stenoscopy in current day clinical practice? Of course, there is definitely a need for media stenoscopy because we need to get into the center of the nodes and we need to access nodes which are not accessible by endoscopic ultrasound and EBUS. And also there are several mediastinal incidentalomas which are being detected with improved cross-sectional imaging which need uh, both imaging, biopsies and follow-up. For all these things, I think we require good imaging. I think media stenoscopy is a good, endoscopic media stenoscopy would be a good alternative to conventional uh, interventions as of today. Now, this is a new endoscopic terrain, very, very risky terrain. We don't know what we're in for. It is absolutely risky, but actually we have phenomenal gastroenterologists, endoscopists across the world, some of these leaders here who I'm sure will make this a reality. So this media stenoscopy, we are going from the endoscopic lumen into the media stenum now. But is conventional anatomy applicable in current day endoscopic practice? See, we are all talking about this media stenum, which has got a superior media stenum and anterior uh, uh, middle media stenum and the posterior media stenum. The conventional anatomy, what was written by Gray's anatomy, we all tell everybody that we know Gray's anatomy inside out. Please, 
The Gray's anatomy is never written inside out. He's written it outside inside. The entire anatomy is a myth. So what we have to know is Henry Gray wrote anatomy from outside in. And for the current day endoscopist, the entire anatomy has to be rewritten. It has to be an anatomy which has to be rewritten from inside out. Like what the laparoscopic surgeons have done, we've rewritten the entire anatomy of the inguinal canal and we started the entire anatomy is totally changed right now. So the endoscopies do require the same thing. This is what we look for. Actually, this is what we're looking for. This is what we're looking at as an endoscopic image. But look what is beyond this. This is very, very important. Absolutely a phenomenal, dangerous space. Which in, and we are getting into an area of endoclostrophobia. You know, you're getting into a tunnel. You don't know what you're in for on the other side. Unless and until we know this anatomy very well, interventions are going to be very, very risky. So the anatomy has to be rewritten, relearned, and to overcome this endoscopic claustrophobia that we're going to have once we get into this new terrain of mediastinum. Like rewritten for the inguinal canal, I think we have to rewrite the entire anatomy. See, so this is the transoral mediastinoscopy axis. Actually, these are the initial experimental work. You can see this actually. So we can make the subcaranial incision, usually lateral on the anterior side to get an access into the media stenum. And the, with the conventional endoscopic technique, whatever third space endoscopic te uh, techniques, now these are the structures that we are able to see. You'll be able to see some azygos wing, you'll be able to see the lung, you'll be able to see the pericardium, you'll be able to see the thoracic ducts, and you'll be able to see, you'll be encountering bigger vessels than what we encounter in the third space endoscopy. So this, we have to be tuned to see this. We have a tremendous experience with submucosal uh, third space, but the vessels that we are going to encounter, structures that we are going to encounter, are totally different what we are seeing in the third space. We should be mentally prepared. You can see that you can see the lung on the other side, and once you break open the pleura, you will go into the pleural cavity. So this is the newest terrain that the endoscopists are going to get in, and we'll have umpteen number of pathologies that we can encounter. The biggest thing that we know have to know that this mediastinum, please, the pleura are not just confined to this thoracic cavity. These are connected via the diaphragm to the abdominal uh, peritoneal reflections. And any intervention on this gets transmitted through the diaphragm onto the peritoneal side. And any infections, subcutaneous emphysema, pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, pneumoperitoneum, and you can have hemodynamic uh, hemo instability caused by, uh, caused by carbon dioxide insufflation. And the physiological changes, like we have laparoscopy. When we have the laparoscopy, we know that there's positive pressure in the, in the pleural cavity. But when you come to mediastinoscopy, we should understand that there is positive pressure in the esophageal lumen and a positive pressure in the mediastinum. And the scope which was shown by Nakajima is a beautiful scope which can control the carbon dioxide, which is of great importance if we have to do any of these interventions. Now, there is a lot of complications that occur, especially when you get into mediastinum, crepitus, insufflation problems, because as in today, we just have uh, low, medium, and high flow uh, insufflation devices on the endoscopy side. Hypercarbia can be result because of excessive insufflation of carbon dioxide, acidosis. There could be changes in lung compliance, and then there are evidence of cardiac arrhythmias, tachycardias, and hypertension because of this. And there's a lot of physiological changes that we need to understand both from the clinician side and the anesthetist who's handling it to see, look for the cardiovascular responses in the mean, in the form of mean, increased mean arterial pressure and heart rate and direct causes of absorbed carbon dioxide, mechanical vascular compression, sympathetic stimulation, secretion of non epidin All these are consequences of uh, getting into the media stem and insufflating the media stem under uncontrolled pressure. The impairment of systemic uh, carbon dioxide imbalance uh, increases the Pmax pressure, and they have umpteen number of complications that can result because of this. And we have one sepsis comes in. So fortunately, there have not been great reports of any sepsis in third space endoscopy. But when we get into the media sternum, it is likely that it could be some sepsis, septic complication that could arise because of the limitations of endoscopic sterilization that we have. These have to be, as in today, require extensive drainage. Suppose the complications occur, these have to be required extensive intervention. But we have some expertise on endoscopic side in the form of endoscopic vacuum therapy where we are able to deal with some of these media sterile collections. Already we have this collection. So I think media stenoscopy, 
complications, some of these complications can be very effectively controlled endoscopically. This is one aspect wherein we learned about treating endoscopic complications before we started doing endoscopic interventions in media system. This is the biggest thing that has happened on endoscopy side. We now know how to treat any endoscopic complications in mediastinum, so we are in a better form. So what we require is newer endoscopes with, with wider angle of vision so that we are not uh, limited by the vision because we should re require rear wide angle uh, vision scope so that we have a wide angle. In fact, I think uh, we've been trying out the side wing scope in mediastinum to see if we can do some improved dissection uh, in the mediastinum after we do this thing. I think we'll show you a couple of videos very soon. Uh, the other thing that uh, fascinates me is actually all these endoscopic ultrasounds, suppose, because suppose you're able to get this endoscopic ultrasound into the third space, you do a myotomy and you get into the mediastinum, we're getting closer to the pathologies which are not accessible initially, and you talk about a transesophageal mediastinal ultrasound, actually could be a new modality. Now we require safe access closure devices, we require safe extraction techniques, and maybe some robotics like this, which can create and close the thing. Actually, this is a cartoon that I made for my department, which can make uh, robot, advanced robotics that uh, we have. It is likely that these can make some, and we have some advanced endoscopic robotic uh, technology like what Philip had showed you. If these can make inroads into clinical practice, I think these can get into the media stenum. And of course, whatever access that you have, we have some good healing devices that can make this uh, access closure. Artificial intelligence also seems to be uh, having a big uh, uh, role in the uh, in the media stream, right? A lot of uh, literature coming up to see how artificial intelligence can be used for in imaging uh, media stranded lesions, in, uh, biopsies of media stranded lesions. We look forward for more of these things. Uh, basic science seems to be having a big role in this. Actually, uh, this is a cartoon that I made for my department some time back, talking about some sort of a tissue engineering, wherein you can have some robotic tissue engineering, which can automatically seal what the defects that we made in the esophagus. This is a cartoon that I thought is a ridiculous cartoon that I made almost about a decade back. But uh, in the last uh, year, uh, we have successfully regenerated esophagus in our, physio our, physio in our basic sciences lab. Actually, this is one a rapid experiment wherein we have removed the entire uh, the muscle, the muscle cord, leaving behind the muscular tube, and we wrapped it up with this uh, uh, pluripotent stem cell membrane, and we are surprised to see that the entire muscular cord regenerated. This is a beautiful thing that has happened in the basic science department from our side, and we have gone on to now we are doing the next experiment we are planning to do is to do a full thickness transection of a segment of esophagus and replace this with a fully covered stem, which is covered with a pluripotent stem cell membrane, and then use this as a bridge. And we hope that this would regenerate the esophagus. This, I don't have any result, but we have data to show that the muscle coat completely regenerates. Actually, we have been associated with Professor Kulvinder Dua, who has been, uh, who has been our partner doing these procedures. We hope that some of these procedures become true, and so that the media cell interventions could become more and more easier. So to conclude, mediastinal access seems to be feasible. Already we have seen mediastinum. It seems we are able to get into mediastinum. Uh, it has got far-reaching advantages, uh, advantages and it has got a very good, great potential. We need to understand the anatomy from inside out and also need to understand the physiological changes that occur. Your energy sources, retraction devices, scopes, and techniques will make this technique safer. Robotics, artificial intelligence, basic science would uh, complement the progress of this technique. But ultimately, it's a combined effort of uh, several techniques and technologies, several departments like cooperative surgery, robotics, artificial intelligence, advanced scopes, basic sciences, maybe image enhancement that are likely to make this new endoscopic, a new terrain more accessible, more safer for intervention. And I think in the next decade or so, we'll be seeing more and more of these interventions, uh, which could become more clinically practical in clinical medicine, and I'm sure uh, with, the, uh, with the techniques and the zeal that the endoscopists have across the world, this should not be a far-fetched dream. Thank you so much once again for the patient. Thank you. Thank you, Jiwi. So in the interest of time, I think uh, we need to move on, but uh, very nice uh, lecture. And uh, so illustrating the how endoscopy can apply to uh, space beyond the GI lumen. And uh, I think, uh, Jiwi, can you introduce uh, Dr. Doshi. Thank you so much again. Uh, uh, 
So uh, from this, we go on to the next uh, talk and the last talk of this uh, session on technological advances in endoluminal surgery. Uh, we have Dr. Joshi from National University Hospital Singapore, who is a big name in endoscopy, big name in international circles, and has contributed significantly to endoscopic practice, endoscopic interventions. And I would request Professor Joshi to talk on the recent advances in pancreatic or biliary endoscopy that are changing the entire concept and improving the outcomes of uh, pathology that we encounter in biliopancreatic uh, area. Over to Professor Joshi. Thank you very much, uh, uh, organizing committee and uh, uh, the chairpersons. Uh, that's a very kind introduction. Uh, so I understand that we are limited on time, so I'm going to focus mainly on the videos and um, uh, perhaps uh, may have to uh, skim through some slides. But essentially, I think uh, in terms of pancreatic biliary endoscopy, I think any uh, endoscopist who regularly performs EUS and ERCP would probably agree that lumen opposing stents have been the biggest uh, breakthrough or the game changer for us in pancreatic biliary endoscopy. Uh, these are specially designed stents with a, a dumbbell shape that uh, help to bring two structures together by the help of the dumbbell and uh, an apposition force that is exerted by the two ends of the dumbbell. They were originally designed for peripancreatic fluid collections, but uh, many uses have subsequently been found. There are a whole host of different uh, stents that are available on the market, uh, but I think currently the most widely and the commonly used and certainly the most established is the axial stent and more specifically the hot axial stent, which has a electrocautery device on the tip of it, which allows easy, uh, quick placement of the stent. So just to uh, get, show you a video, this is an elderly lady who was referred with a um, uh, history of sepsis in ICU, infected pseudosis. Um, we, we had a CT scan to confirm the pseudosis and uh, we could drain the pseudosis without fluoroscopy in ICU in less time than it takes to do an OGD. Um, the caliber of the stent is wide enough for us to later on perform necrosectomies and, and allow better drainage of these uh, uh, collections compared to the old traditional technique of just placing um, plastic stents into these uh, cavities. The data also seems pretty convincing. If you look at the clinical studies that have compared lumen opposing stents versus plastic stents in pancreatic fluid collections, uh, the data seems to be in favor, at least in terms of clinical success for lumen opposing stents. I just have to add a, a word of warning. The complication rates can potentially be higher if the stents are not managed carefully. So most of the newer studies have suggested that if these stents are left in for more than four weeks or the time that it takes for this pancreatic fluid collection to heal, then the risk of bleeding is significantly higher. And that kind of makes sense because as the cavity collapses, the, uh, the bare end of the lumen uh, opposing stent will uh, abrade against any vascular structures in, in the uh, lesser sac and will cause a pseudoaneurysm and hence bleeding. So I think as long as they're removed within four weeks, the complication rates look to be uh, no different than, uh, than plastic stents, but the uh, clinical and technical success and the ease of use is significantly better. Um, the lumen opposing stents also allow us to gain entry into the biliary system, particularly in patients who are for palliation, who have pancreatic cancers with obstruction of the head of the pancreas. This was a patient who was referred to me with a uh, head of pancreas tumor. Uh, we could not enter the duodenum, so we placed a scope, uh, an EUS scope in D1. We can uh, identify the biliary system. We can uh, do a cholangiogram. Uh, you can see the stricture downstream of the cholangiogram. Uh, we can then puncture the bile duct, uh, the dilated bile duct, and place uh, an axial stent between the bile duct and the duodenum to allow free drainage of the biliary system. Uh, sometimes we place a plastic stent in uh, at the same time just to orientate the axis of the stent up towards the hilum because we don't want the stent to occlude against the back wall of the, uh, of the uh, bile duct. Um, there has been one meta-analysis uh, looking at three randomized control studies uh, in EUS versus ERCP drainage in uh, palliative uh, distal bile duct obstruction. Uh, 
And essentially, uh, in, in the EUS group, there was about 112 patients. In the ERCP group, there was about 110 patients. And there was no difference in technical or clinical success, but there was a significantly shorter procedure time with EUS CDS. Uh, and also in terms of adverse events, uh, it was significantly higher in the ERCP group. And that kind of makes sense. If you're going to manipulate the ampulla, there is a significantly higher risk of pancreatitis. Because the stents are relatively large caliber, uh, the risk of stent dysfunction is also less in the EUS CDS group. So uh, the EUS guided gallbladder drainage is also a rapidly evolving uh, uh, technique um, and made possible by these lumen opposing stents. Uh, they're useful in patients with acute cholecystitis or gallbladder empyema who are not suitable candidates for surgery and require drainage on a long-term basis. There have been some studies that have compared EUS guided gallbladder drainage with percutaneous drainage. And again, there's been no significant difference in clinical or technical success. Interestingly, in terms of adverse events, there's been less adverse events and reduced need for reintervention. And that kind of makes sense because if you're puncturing externally and you've got a drain externally, you're always going to end up with dislodged drains and tubes. Whereas internally, it's much more secure, particularly with the apposition force of the lumen opposing stents. EUS is also used uh, for gastroenterostomies. There are various te techniques that have been described in the literature. My preferred technique, uh, as demonstrated in this patient with a distal pancreatectomy in the past for pancreatic cancer uh, with recurrence of tumor, is uh, to actually get a wire down into the uh, distal duodenum beyond the ligament of triads. We, uh, we uh, instill water and, uh, with a bit of methylene blue and dye uh, into the small bowel. We can identify that on EUS uh, through the stomach wall and uh, very clearly be able to see the uh, loop of bowel, be able to puncture that and uh, deploy the lumen opposing stent to create a fistula uh, or track between the duodenum and uh, the stomach. Uh, these patients can normally eat within 24 hours and are home at day three with um, just perhaps IV antibiotics for the first day. Uh, and they generally tend to do very well. This patient survived for 12 months after the procedure and uh, was, uh, was managed with chemotherapy for their underlying tumor and did very well. So the data, uh, this is a study comparing US guided uh, gastroenterostomy with uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, GJ. It's not a randomized study, but there was a, approximately 20 something patients on each arm. And what you can see is the clinical success, despite the EUS group being a, a significantly more uh, complex group of patients, the clinical success was not dissimilar to the uh, surgical uh, success rate, but the adverse events were significantly lower and the cost of the procedure is also significantly lower. This procedure takes about 20 minutes to do uh, in, in endoscopy suite. Um, the next procedure to talk about or the next device that is coming in and which uh, is probably going to make uh, uh, inroads into our management, uh, particularly for uh, uh, unresectable pancreatic adenocarcinomas or even secretory uh, inoperable pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and perhaps in the future even for mucinocystic lesions, is EUS RFA. Uh, this uh, case was a patient that was referred to me for uh, a, a vipoma, which was inoperable in the head. Um, and here you can see I've ablated the tumor. We, uh, the, the, the white tissue and the bubbling is the ablation of the uh, pancreatic tumor. I tend to put a pancreatic stent in these patients to reduce the risk of pancreatitis, but there is no strong data. Uh, as I said, it's early days, so I don't think there's enough uh, uh, studies out there. But uh, certainly in my practice, I have not had a single pancreatitis yet with uh, ablation, ablative techniques. Um, here we did a contrast enhanced EUS after ablation of the pancreatic neuroendocrine, which showed that there was no further uh, flow within the tumor. And this patient uh, did not require any further systemic therapy for their symptoms for their neuroendocrine tumor and has been going well for more than 12 months now. So um, very quickly, uh, Confocal laser uh, endomicroscopy is, again, a useful device that's being developed for uh, pancreatic uh, cystic structures. The reason for this is because pancreatic cysts uh, are difficult to diagnose in up to 10% of patients, despite imaging and 
EUS and biopsy. And I think uh, endomicroscopy certainly has a role in uh, helping diagnose pancreatic cyst and helping to identify the more uh, malignant potential mucinous cyst. The other device that's going to be coming out in the market is a uh, portal pressure measuring device that's going to be used in conjunction with EUS. EUS allows easy access into the hepatic and portal veins and the portal pressure measuring device allows us uh, 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 the ability to measure gradient uh, between the portal pressure, between the hepatic veins and the portal vein. And this is extremely useful in management of patients with chronic liver disease and cirrhosis. Finally, it's not all about endoscopy. There are other devices that are on the market that do help us with our uh, ERCPs. This particular device is a uh, Siemens uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, live imaging of the biliary system. This patient was referred to me for a post-transplant stricture. And here you can see I, I couldn't get into the anterior duct, so we injected contrast and did a three-dimensional live imaging. This allows me easy understanding of the anatomy without the need for an MRCP, and I could access both the posterior ductal system and the anterior ductal system with the help of this uh, imaging technique. This is the anterior ductal system. So in conclusion, um, uh, uh, endoscopy, uh, hepatobiliary endoscopy or pancreatobiliary endoscopy is uh, very exciting and there's a lot of different devices that are available and are going to be available soon. And I think this is a, a, a space to watch. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, it's, a, it's a really a great uh, lecture to demonstrate uh, the uh, advancement in the pancreatohepatobiliary uh, endoscopy, US and ELCP. So I think uh, we have uh, three minutes left. So uh, uh, we don't have any questions uh, from the delegates. Uh, so uh, any question for us, we can discuss. So uh, I'd like to ask uh, Jiwi and uh, Professor Inoue because uh, your lecture, both of your lecture is uh, about how to get out of the GI lumen into the first space. So um, especially in terms of uh, performing the fundamentation, you need to get into the abdominal cavity and the uh, GV, you need to get into the bidesinum. So uh, uh, any kind of uh, imaging or any kind of uh, 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 technology that you, can, you think can help us to understand the anatomy better. So as mentioned uh, that uh, we have to learn the anatomy from inside out. So, how do you know about the anatomy? It's, it's easy to be confused. So, uh, can I talk? Yes. So, yes. yes. So, thank you very much. Good question. And the, uh, um, in my experience, the anterior approach, and then uh, from the esophagus approach, the mediastinum, the media, uh, recognition of a mediastinum stru uh, structure, it, mm, so trachea is easy to recognize, but the uh, lymph node is a uh, it's a little bit difficult to identify the exactly uh, with some assistance. But in the abdominal cavity, abdominal cavity, um, everything um, stay in the um, backside. So um, I, I mean the uh, approach to the anterior stomach and the anterior something. So our small intestine or, or um, uh, peritoneum or some other. So well, we can uh, access uh, relatively easy and the uh, anatomical uh, orientation is uh, uh, very um, uh, friendly to us. So uh, Professor Inoue, actually I, I, uh, I personally feel whenever we're doing any of this endoscopic uh, transluminal procedures, uh, do you think for the initial part before we stabilize procedures, a needle laparoscopic assistance or a needle thoracoscopic assistance on the other side, I personally believe would be very advantageous till we master the endoscopic way to manipulate ourselves into these cavities and uh, structures. So I personally believe at least a needle scope or a 5mm scope assistance on the other side would be of great advantage. I know it's you're increasing the invasiveness, but I think as a bridge to completely endoscopic procedure before we embark on the complete endoscopy thing, for the safety purpose, I personally believe a combined procedure may be more useful. 
Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Lau. Uh, yes, um, I, I think uh, I, I totally agree with you. So as a bridge, uh, we can uh, combine with the laparoscopy. Thank you, and uh, I think uh, we need to end the session because uh, of the time, but a really nice uh, lecture from all of uh, the faculty. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.